Welcome, everyone. I'm Grace Ferrari, Senior Manager of Education and Support at Parkinson Canada. Thank you for joining us today for our webinar on the role of physiotherapy in Parkinson's disease. I would like to take this opportunity to inform everyone that today's session is being recorded for future viewing and can be accessed by visiting our website at www.parkinson.ca and visiting our YouTube channel. Before I introduce our speakers, I have a few housekeeping points to review. For technical support at any time during today's webinar, please click the text support button at the lower right of your screen next to the Ask a Question button. You will have an opportunity to submit questions at any point during today's session from your computer screen by clicking the Ask a Question button at the bottom right of your screen and typing in your question. Every effort will be made to answer all questions at the end of the presentation, but we do ask that you keep questions of a general nature and not seek medical advice. And now I'd like to provide a brief introduction of our presenters today. Jan goldstein Elman and Rebecca Gruber are physiotherapists and co-owners of One Step Ahead Mobility Physiotherapy in Toronto and have been in clinical practice for more than 25 years, focusing on neurological and geriatric rehabilitation. Both have completed advanced degrees and extensive postgraduate training and certification, including both S LSVT, BIG, and POWER for PD. Rebecca completed her clinical specialist certification through CPA in neurosciences in 2012. Jan and Rebecca have a strong commitment to best practices and since 1997 have developed, implemented, and systematically evaluated physiotherapy services for PD at organizations in the greater Toronto area, including Baycrest, Toronto Public Health, and the Center for Movement Disorders. Both are lecturers in the Department of Physical Therapy at the University of Toronto. They regularly present research findings on physiotherapy interventions in PD at national and international scientific conferences. I will now turn it over to Jan and Rebecca. Good afternoon and thank you, Grace. Um, good afternoon or morning, depending on where you are joining us from in Canada. And welcome to today's Parkinson Canada webinar. I am Rebecca. And I am Jan. And we are both, as Grace said, coming to you from Toronto. We'll both be speaking and answering your questions at the end of today's session. I won't repeat our bios, but we'll let you all know a little bit about our clinic, One Step Ahead Mobility where we offer a wide range of services for people with Parkinson's and other movement disorders. And although we have only one clinic site, we serve as a resource to health professionals and people with Parkinson's throughout Canada. We're happy to, to try to help no matter where you are located and can be reached via our website. You'll find the address for our website at the end of this slide presentation. As I said, there will be some time for questions from the audience at the end of this webinar. The aim of our talk today is to provide you with the current evidence from the scientific literature on the importance of exercise in general and the role of physiotherapy specifically for people with Parkinson's at all stages of the condition. Most of you are familiar with the motor or so-called cardinal signs of Parkinson's. For a clinical diagnosis of Parkinson's disease, two of the four cardinal signs of the condition must be present. Um, not everyone with Parkinson's experiences a resting tremor. Muscle rigidity or stiffness and bradykinesia or slower, smaller movements are the symptoms that can contribute most to the difficulties people with Parkinson's have with mobility and with everyday function. Postural instability is a motor symptom that is not present in early Parkinson's and it's often misunderstood. The term is not related to how straight you are when you're sitting or standing up, but refers instead to a specific component of balance. 
the person's ability to right themselves or stay steady when displaced. In later stages, when postural instability is present, it can be a contributor to loss of balance and to falling, and we will discuss this later in the presentation. Recently, the non-motor effects of Parkinson's are more widely recognized, and for some people, these symptoms can be as or even more debilitating to quality of life than the motor signs alone. These non-motor issues can also have an effect on a person with Parkinson's mobility. For example, anxiety and depression can have a profound effect on how much a person with Parkinson's is motivated to be active. It is therefore essential that people with Parkinson's discuss all of their symptoms with their doctor so that they can be appropriately addressed. The prevalence of Parkinson's, which means the number of people living with this condition, is expected to double by the year 2040. Advancements in medical treatments have given people with Parkinson's much longer lifespans. Exercise has the potential, in conjunction with optimal medical management, to allow people to live both long and well with the condition. When we talk about published research, we are referring to results of scientific studies that are reviewed by experts and published in academic journals. The scientific research published on exercise and Parkinson's has exploded in the past few years. With 33 randomized controlled trials published between the years 2013 and 2015 alone. And the evidence for the importance of exercise in this condition is mounting. Research shows that exercise is associated with better movement and independence, fewer complications, and longer life in people with Parkinson's. And studies also show that a sedentary lifestyle contributes to worsening of both the motor and the non-motor symptoms of Parkinson's, as well as to disability in Parkinson's. The National Parkinson's Foundation in the United States has a database of information about people with Parkinson's, and these data were used by OGU and colleagues to analyze variables that correlate with levels of exercise in Parkinson's clients across disease severity. Data from over 2,000 people were included in the longitudinal study. What the researchers found was that people categorized as regular exercises, ex exercisers, those that were exercising for at least 150 minutes a week at baseline had better quality of life, mobility, and physical function, less progression of disease, less caregiver burden, and less cognitive decline one year later after controlling for demographic and disease severity variables. Another very important piece of information from the research is that on average, people with Parkinson's are about 30% less active than their age-matched controls. Activity levels go down with disease progression, but even at the time of diagnosis and in early stages, physical activity levels are lower in Parkinson's. We don't really know why this is true, but it could be that as the symptoms of the condition develop over many years, and since Parkinson's is often not diagnosed until motor symptoms are present for some time, that the difficulties with movement lead to reduced physical activity even before the condition is diagnosed. Since we now are aware of the important contribution of physical activity to well-being in Parkinson's, it is imperative that we do all we can to promote sustained activity levels in people with Parkinson's throughout their lives. Our clients chuckle at this one. Current research shows that individualized exercise treatment, which physiotherapists are experts at prescribing and monitoring in the context of health conditions, can promote important therapeutic outcomes for people with Parkinson's. A 2013 Cochrane Best Evidence Review of 39 high-quality randomized controlled trials with nearly 2,000 participants 
reports evidence in favor of physiotherapy compared to no therapy, with statistically and clinically meaningful improvements in endurance, balance, walking, mobility, and perceived quality of life with physiotherapy intervention in Parkinson's. And there are now guidelines for physiotherapy in Parkinson's based on a comprehensive multi-panel review of the literature and best evidence. These guidelines have been implemented in Europe and in South America, specifically in Brazil. We are currently in discussions with the original developers in the Netherlands to determine how we can disseminate these guidelines across Canada. In addition to providing recommendations for assessment and treatment of Parkinson's-related mobility issues, the European Guidelines for Physiotherapy and Parkinson's also highlight the need for physiotherapists seeing people with Parkinson's to have advanced training and experience specific to this population. Most physiotherapists have training and experience with orthopedic conditions, such as fractures or back and neck pain. Few physiotherapists have advanced knowledge and experience with neurological conditions, and fewer still have relevant training in Parkinson's. The European guidelines stipulate that physiotherapists need to have advanced training to work with people with Parkinson's. The evidence-based European guidelines detail the goals of physiotherapy assessment and treatment in early, middle, and late stages of Parkinson's in all of the areas listed in this slide. These core areas of physical mobility may be affected in anyone with Parkinson's at any stage and should be addressed according to the person's individual needs. Physical capacity, or stamina and endurance, transfers, for example, getting up from low seats, getting into and out of bed or into and out of the bath or the car, balance and falls prevention, gait or walking, and the ability to perform small movements with the hands that are required for functions such as buttons and writing or typing, these form the bulk of the issues that are addressed by physiotherapists. The last core area for physiotherapy and Parkinson's is the area of neuroprotection. You may have heard this term or heard the term neuroplasticity. These are exciting new areas of study in neurological conditions, including in progressive conditions such as Parkinson's. In the past three decades, among the most promising and exciting advances in neuroscientific research has been the discovery that the brain has great recovery potential through a process of reorganization called neuroplasticity defi defined here. We now know that this phenomenon can be facilitated through activity-dependent processes such as forced use of the injured area, complex skill training, and intensive exercise. Most of the research into neuroplasticity has been conducted in the areas of stroke and spinal cord injury, but in the last few decades, results of research studying the principles of neuroplasticity and their effects on progressive neurological conditions such as Parkinson's have also emerged. The first two principles of neuroplasticity are that what you use will be maintained or improved, and what you use less or don't use will likely get worse. In Parkinson's, for example, people often notice that one hand is less able to perform movements that require dexterity, such as reaching for a glass at dinner or getting keys from a pocket. People will, often without even realizing it, stop using the more affected hand and the less they use this hand, the worse their dexterity becomes. Intensity and specificity of practice are both important components needed for neuroplastic change to occur. In order for movements to improve, a person must practice intensively. Think about how much practice is needed to learn to play a musical instrument or to speak a foreign language. The practice also needs to be specific to the functions or activities that are important to the individual, that is, salient. The best example Jan and I give to all of our clients with Parkinson's is that doing, to exor doing exercises 
to strengthen their leg muscles is a good thing to do. But in order to be able to get up from a low seat, one has to practice this specific activity in the right way over and over. This is the only way to improve the specific function. Age and stage of condition will also affect how much change can be made. Think of how easily children absorb new things and heal as compared with adults. That's not to say that adults don't have the potential for change through neuroplasticity, but certainly both age and stage of condition affect this potential. Initial studies into neuroprotection and neuroplasticity were conducted in mice who were made to have Parkinson's symptoms. And this enabled researchers to study the effects of exercise on the autopsied mice brains, something that clearly can't be replicated with a human cohort. However, it is important to remember that mice and humans are very different and we can't extrapolate results from mice studies directly to humans. In humans, studies are showing evidence of the benefits of intensive aerobic exercise in early and mid-stage Parkinson's on motor and cognitive symptoms and on physical functioning. When summarizing the research that has been published thus far from studies of exercise in people with Parkinson's, the main implications are that people with Parkinson's need intensive aerobic conditioning. conditioning. So what does this mean for the person with Parkinson's? Aerobic exercise is defined as any physical activity that makes a person sweat and causes increased breathing effort and heart rate. It is contrasted, for example, with strength training and short distance running. It is an effort that can be maintained for at least 10 minutes. It increases blood flow and brain circulation and likely helps with increased production of brain growth factors that are important for neuroplasticity to occur. But aerobic activity isn't the whole story. The activity engaged in needs to also be intensive to produce positive effects. In an important systematic review of aerobic exercise studies in Parkinson's, Shu and colleagues found that those studies that included intensive aerobic activity reported more positive results in terms of balance, mobility, and gait than less intensive activity. And again, what do we mean when we say intensive, intensive exercise? exercise? Intensity refers to the frequency, duration, and challenge of the activity that is engaged in. Shu and colleagues found that the studies with the best outcomes included an aerobic exercise frequency of two to four times per week for a duration of six to 14 weeks for a total of 12 to 42 hours of exercise intervention. Of course, any increase in physical activity must be cleared with your medical team before initiation. There are other factors that need to be decided and determined before one in increases one's uh, exercise. So in conclusion, on the research so far, ongoing intensive aerobic exercise is needed for better outcomes for people with Parkinson's in conjunction with medical supervision and with Parkinson's medications. Appropriate medical intervention, including the right medications, dosage, and timing will help the person with Parkinson's to exercise most effectively. Physiotherapists are uniquely qualified to design graduated conditioning programs to improve physical capacity in the context of Parkinson's symptoms and pathology at all stages of the condition. A physiotherapist can help you develop and maintain the best exercise program for you right now. So let's talk a little bit about the exercise programs and regimens that some people with Parkinson's are engaging in. Jan and I are often asked about the perception of superior effects of aerobic exercise using a stationary bike. And this is probably because many people have read about the studies by Rigel Alberts and colleagues. 
the model that they used was a tandem stationary bike where the person at the front set the pace and this person did not have Parkinson's. And the person who set the pace pedaled at a cadence or speed that was 30% faster than the person with Parkinson's would have done on their own. So on average, the pedaling was 80 to 90 revolutions per minute. One of the publications from these studies is aptly titled, It's Not About the Bike, But It Is About the Pedaling. The positive effects exhibited or demonstrated in this study were actually a result of the intensive aerobic activity, not the bicycle itself. That's not to say that stationary cycling with Parkinson's isn't of benefit, but that what matters is how it's done. The issue for many people with Parkinson's, and for everyone really, is that exercise is important, but we can't be spending our entire days and weeks doing different types of exercise. Because of this, in our clinic and with our clients, we focus more on training people to walk properly and intensively on a treadmill whenever possible. There have been many studies that look at treadmill walking as trained by a physiotherapist with and without the support of a harness and the carryover effects on regular walking when the person with Parkinson's is off the treadmill. When we train people with Parkinson's in treadmill walking, we can increase the intensity gradually as well as incorporate challenges to the activity such as working on increasing step length, improving posture, and arm swing. In this way, we can help people with Parkinson's exercise effectively and improve their walking when they aren't on the treadmill. And we call this the biggest bang for your exercise buck. A word of caution, just as you need to have medical clearance to engage in increased aerobic activity, you should be trained by a physiotherapist to walk safely and properly on the treadmill. So in summary, the research is showing that the best exercise to promote physical mobility in Parkinson's includes intensive aerobic activity and is mentally engaging and challenging. Recently, the adaptation of different types of group community exercise programs for Parkinson's, such as those listed in this slide here, have gained considerable attention as a means for ongoing maintenance of good physical capacity. The true benefits of these different community exercise approaches and the best implementation methods are not yet fully established with the quality of research varying widely among the different studies. The relevant question for this discussion is, can these exercise programs meet the need for people with Parkinson's to engage in intensive, aerobic, and challenging physical activity? There is no question that these types of programs can, at least in theory, challenge motor and cognitive skills provide intensive aerobic exercise, and also be sociable and enjoyable. Again, as with cycling, it's not the activity itself, but rather what principles of effective exercise for Parkinson's are addressed, including how the person with Parkinson's performs the activity. And in the next part of this presentation, Jan will explain the issues people with Parkinson's have with how they move and how physiotherapists can help. Hello, this is Jan now. The research that Rebecca detailed just now provides a lot of information on the type of exercise you need to be engaged in. You may be wondering at this point what you need a physiotherapist with expertise in Parkinson's for if you're already exercising. The fact is, is that with everyone with Parkinson's presents with unique manifestations of the condition that vary over time. 
physiotherapist experienced in Parkinson's treat in Parkinson's treatment can assess symptoms and and prescribe and monitor the type, duration, and intensity of exercise for best results. As well, everyone with Parkinson's has a problem with movement amplitude. What I mean by this is that because it is harder to move with Parkinson's, people's movements become smaller over time. And because the changes are gradual over time, the person with Parkinson's has difficulty perceiving that their movements are smaller than normal. For example, how many of you shuffle or drag at least one foot when you walk? You probably don't even realize that this is because you are actually taking smaller steps. Other times, how many of you are told that you aren't standing up straight? You may not even feel that your posture has changed and be surprised when you see yourself in mirror or in pictures. People with Parkinson's need to be retrained in and intensively practice normal posture and movement in order to move well in their daily lives and in order to get the best results from whatever exercise they are engaged in. A person, for example, who goes to boxing classes and boxes with stooped posture and small arm movements will not get as much from the class as someone who is able to incorporate large amplitude movements into everything they're doing, including the boxing. The same is true for everyday functional activities. Physiotherapists are also uniquely qualified to assess and treat the movement impairments that lead to disability in Parkinson's. The ability to get up from a low seat, in and out of a car, or into and out of bed, put on or take off a jacket with ease, to walk, run, use a computer, or cut food, for example, are all affected by Parkinson's. General exercise, dance, yoga, tai chi, and boxing, though potentially beneficial for posture, balance, and perceived quality of life, do not retrain the person with Parkinson's to move and do everyday activities in a normal way. Physiotherapists with specialized training and experience experience can help you do that. Parkinson's affects functional mobility and results in difficulty with daily normal activities, such as turning over a bed, getting up from a chair, and walking, just to name a few. Changes in function are apparent even when people are first diagnosed with Parkinson's, and as I said before, are often not perceived by the par- person with Parkinson's. There is a misconception that by exercising intensively and improving fitness, that a person will be able to move better when performing their daily functions. But this isn't necessarily true. In order to be able to get in and out of bed or up from a low seat when you have Parkinson's, You have to learn and practice how to do these things normally. A Parkinson's physiotherapist can assess and provide the right strategies so that your movements and function are more normal and independent. The activities highlighted in this slide are commonly affected by Parkinson's. You may note that you have some difficulty with these and or other aspects of your daily life. In early Parkinson's, you may be able to do everything, but you may be slower, clumsier, or to do things in a different way. In later stages, there may be things that you have a lot more trouble doing, and people with Parkinson's in all stages of the condition can improve their movement and functional abilities.
Physiotherapists with advanced training in amplitude-focused programs, such as LSVT Big or Power, can help people with Parkinson's learn to perform bigger, more normal movements and to translate this, these activities into their daily lives. Using the principles of neuroplasticity we discussed earlier, intensive practice of salient or specific tasks such as opening up a door or walking in a crowded restaurant with large amplitude movements leads to improved performance of the tasks. I'm going to talk a little bit about falls. People with Parkinson's in later stages have more balance-related problems that can affect their safety. Falls can be common and dangerous in people with Parkinson's in later stages. Falling has been correlated with disease duration, cognition, and physical disability. A substantial number of falls in people with Parkinson's are reported to occur when they attempt to do more than one thing at a time. For example, walking when there are distractions around them. As well, freezing of gait is a phenomenon that is correlated with falling, and I will be detailing that a little bit further in just a moment. Because falls are a leading cause of injury, preventing even one fall in a person with Parkinson's can be significant. However, it becomes extremely difficult to study specific interventions to prevent falls. Falls are multifactorial. Risk factors include intrinsic issues such as balance and cognition, but also extrinsic extrinsic or external factors like medication and the environment. Some factors are modifiable and some are not. And the more physically active a person with Parkinson's is, the more at risk they are for falls. Yet we want people to be active. As well, falls reporting is often inaccurate because people tend to dismiss a fall if it isn't if it hasn't resulted in an injury. Falls prevention programs can be effective in reducing falls when they are well supervised, trained by professionals, so that participants can be challenged in a safe environment. Large group sitting exercise programs are not likely to lead to improvements in balance for standing and walking or to a reduction in falling. I'm going to talk a little bit about freezing of gait, otherwise known as a fog. One of the most prevalent motor complications of advanced Parkinson's and one of the most likely to lead to falls and injuries is freezing of gait. So what is freezing? It is defined as sudden, sudden episodes of the inability to move or very short, quick movements of the feet that do not lead to walking. It is most likely to occur in later stages of Parkinson's and during times when medications are not working as well or the wearing off periods. Freezing of gait often appears with initiating walking or getting ready to stop, or when trying to go through a doorway. Anxiety and the anticipation of freezing can make it much worse. For example, when you're trying to get on or off an elevator with a small turn and there may be people already in the elevator. Turning in a small space, such as a bathroom or a kitchen, is also often associated with freezing. Distractions, such as dual tasking, can exacerbate the problem.
What causes freezing in Parkinson's? Well, it is not completely understood. It is manifest as a motor problem, but is likely stemming from a combination of systems such as attention and visual spatial perception. It is very difficult to effectively treat. Medication adjustment, including timing of medications, may be helpful. Physiotherapy research has demonstrated effectiveness of attentional cueing strategies and equipment for some people with freezing of gait and in certain situations. These have included visual cues, such as lines, mar lines marked on the floor, and auditory cues, such as a metronome or music. Our clients have reported many creative strategies that they have used to avoid or arrest freezing of gait, such as stepping backwards or sideways before trying to step forwards, marching in place, or stepping over a line or an object, such as a turned down cane. The most important cue is to stop when one begins to experience the smaller, stuttering steps. Rushing is usually part of the problem. When and why a person experiences fog is highly individual. When Rebecca and I work with people to reduce freezing of gait, it is important for us to identify and recreate the situations that elicit the freezing and trial various strategies. There is no one-size-fits-all approach to freezing of gait. Currently, there is ongoing research into rehabilitation programs to prevent freezing of gait. Merrillman and her colleagues are among those studying the effects of virtual reality in Parkinson's using treadmill training in combination with virtual reality environments. Training for the ability to multitask in early stages of Parkinson's is the subject of other recent physiotherapy studies. The hope is that by improving these abilities earlier in the conditions, we can maintain and be able to limit um, freezing of gait in later stages of Parkinson's. So here is the message. Exercise is medicine, and how you exercise and what you do matters. Exercise with Parkinson's is different, and each person with Parkinson's has different needs at different times. So there can't be a one-size-fits-all exercise program. Seeing a physiotherapist with Parkinson-specific training and expertise for personalized assessment and recommendations is important for everyone with this condition at any stage. It will provide you with the skills to get the most out of what other exercise you choose to do and will help you to maintain and improve your functional abilities in your daily life. Regular follow-up with physiotherapists is equally important as needs change and the person with Parkinson's may not be perceiving these changes. We often say that you should follow up with your physiotherapist as often as you do with your neurologist. With modern technology, such as Skype, it's not so difficult to do anymore, no matter where you live. We want to thank you, our clients, Parkinson's Canada, and all of you for listening today. We will now turn this over to Grace, who will moderate your questions and comments. Thank you, Jen and Rebecca. You've provided us with the latest research and given us some thoughtful insights and information that demonstrates not only the importance of exercise in managing symptoms of Parkinson's, but also the importance of obtaining a physical assessment by a physiotherapist who is experienced in Parkinson's before initiating any type of exercise. We now uh, want to remind everyone that you can um, ask questions by typing in your question in the question box on the bottom right of your screen. 
At some point during um, our question answer session, you will be asked to take a few minutes to give us your feedback by completing a short survey. And your input is important and will help identify topics of interest for future webinars, as well as help us better meet your needs. Uh, the first question, Jen and Rebecca, is does exercise prevent the need for levodopa? Um, as we uh, discussed in the presentation, um, the best uh, the best outcomes for people with Parkinson's are when the person with Parkinson's is on the right medication and is taking the right dosage at the right time and also exercising. I mean, it's a combination of of um, work between health professionals to provide the very best for people with Parkinson's. And in fact, often the medication will enable the person with Parkinson's to exercise better, more effectively for their Parkinson's. So they really do go hand in hand. Another question that has come in is, when is the best time to exercise? Well, we can answer that question, um, when is the best time to exercise, in, in looking at in several different um, situations. The best time to exercise when you have um, Parkinson's is to exercise as soon as you're diagnosed and to get started right away. That's not to say that if you've had Parkinson's for a long time, you should not be exercising. So an assessment can help you figure out how best to exercise if you've had Parkinson's for longer, as well as um, the earlier in the condition. Um, what you do and how you exercise really does matter. So the sooner you get involved in exercise is better. And, um, and then looking at how you're going to adhere to an exercise program is equally important because you're in it for, um, for life. The other way to answer that question is when is the best time to exercise if you're talking about the time of day. It's probably best to exercise when you are feeling best because that's when you're going to get the best out of your exercise. Um, if your medications aren't working well at the time or you're feeling particularly sluggish, you're not going to put as much um amplitude into your movements. You're not going to be able to move as well. And part of getting the best out of your exercise is how you're doing it. So they really go hand in hand. So medications, you want to optimize your medication. You want to optimize the best time of day for, for you. Uh, thank you. Jerry asks, are there any studies on biofeedback and PD? Well, I think the answer is a resounding maybe. Um, not that I can recall, and I'm assuming that the idea would be that the biofeedback would help people relax muscles. I'm not sure what um, what the biofeedback would be used for. Biofeedback is um, is it is a, a a technology that helps people. Um, it reinforces certain activities or certain strategies. So I'm not sure if the question is about biofeedback for posture, to improve posture, or biofeedback for reducing um, or for relaxing muscles. In either case, I'm not aware of any studies. Thanks, Rebecca. Sorry. June asks, how can I find a physiotherapist in my area that is familiar with PD? Hello. Um, there are several ways in which you might be able to find um, a physiotherapist in, in your area. Um, you can contact your the, the your local physiotherapy association or college and ask them um, if there's anybody in the in that area who is familiar with Parkinson's. Some of the um, because the 
programs such as um, LSVT Big and Power require you to um, take advanced training. Uh, they on their websites. They also list people in their areas that have um, been trained. Uh, the other thing is is that um, you can always uh, contact us, and we can sort of help problem solve in your area. We have done um, courses for uh, uh, graduate courses for people with um, for physiotherapists who work with people with Parkinson's, and we may have known um, somebody as well who has been in your in your area. Thank you, Jen. Uh, thank you, Rebecca. We have another question. My toes are curling inwards and they are very painful. Can you suggest what can be done to reduce the pain? Um, can you hear me? Yes. You can hear me? Yes. Yes. Um, there's a couple of things here. Usually when people have this type of phenomenon, it's often called dystonia, cramping of the toes, and it often happens first thing in the morning, although it can happen any time of the day. Um, so sometimes adjustment of medication can be helpful because it, it, it sometimes is an indicator that um, the, there's not sufficient dopamine in the system, but that's something to be discussed with your medical person, with your doctor. In terms of um, help with the pain, um, often people tell us, this is again feedback from our patients, that uh, the kind of shoes they wear and whether they have orthotics in their shoes that are good for them makes a difference and helps them to have more room for their toes in the shoe. Um, the other thing is that physiotherapists can provide you with stretches to do when you're having this type of cramping and also during the day so that possibly there's less incidence of cramping. Um, relaxation techniques to reduce the anxiety that people uh, often without even realizing it have when pain starts or stiffness and cramping starts, relaxation techniques can be helpful. Um, I had a client and actually a few clients who, who reported to me that taking something like a, um, a, a water bottle full of water and freezing it and then rolling their foot over the bottle helps to stretch the muscles out and, re and relieve the pain. So again, often these types of issues are, are issues that we've learned to address as physiotherapists because of tips that we've gotten from people with Parkinson's. Thank you, Rebecca. We don't have any further questions, so I want to thank you again, uh, Jen and Rebecca, on behalf of Parkinson Canada. I want to thank everyone for participating in this afternoon's webinar. For more information on Living Well with Parkinson's or to access a recording of today's webinar for future viewing, please visit our website at www.parkinson.ca. And if you have any questions regarding today's session, feel free to contact us by email at info at parkinson.ca or call us toll free at 1-800-565-3000. Thank you again and have a wonderful day.